So I'm with Charles Bernstein. Hello, Charles. How are you? I'm I'm good. I'm sort of don't know where I am right now. I'm lost in this Robert Grenier poem. You yeah, asked me you're... just a couple of days ago, and you know, it, like Alice in Wonderland, I kind of fell into the poem, and uh, <laughs> I just haven't figured out how to get Imagine. out out of the poem. Imagine. But I'm I'm really glad. Maybe talking to you will show me the path. Okay, that's cool. Um, yes, Char Charles has uh, this this drawing poem as a background for his Zoom uh, screen. And we're gonna be talking about one of many poem drawings done by Robert Grenier. And this happens to be poem number three in a series that anyone can see at the EPC, Electronic Poetry Center website. And if you had, just open up your favorite search engine and look, you could just type in Robert Grenier EPC, that'll get you there. And this is one of them, and I, I chose it, and I guess it'll become clear why I chose this one. It's a particularly good one. Yes, a, draw, a drawing poem, four color ink, four different colors of ink, and it's kind of hard to read. And so what we're going to do to start with is we're each going to take a line. Maybe I'll do the first line. Good idea. Uh, or the first word line. And then Charles will do the second one. But, and then we'll but before that, let me just give an orientation to what we're looking at. Um, do, yeah. One thing, we're looking at a notebook, which is turned on the side, but you can see a seam in the center. So the notebook would be folded and opened up and then turned to the side. That's right. what he's actually writing in That's against right. the normal direction of it. Right. And uh, in this particular series, each word has a different color. So we have red, black, green, and blue those uh, four uh, colors that he's used, four color pens, so. And I think it's almost always the case that each word takes a line, what we normally think of as a line, although there's some long words that carry over with a hyphen, I think, and some where he runs out of room. But this happens to be four fairly short words. I'll do the first one. So I see an F, the F on the left is pretty clear, really clear, very unusually clear. Uh, I can't do anything with the second one yet. I see a fractured O, then the G is impinging on the O, and the extender on the G comes all the way back toward the second letter, still uh, unidentified. And the, the fifth letter I would never get without help, without context. So I've got an F, an O, a G, I'm going to intuit that the second letter is an R and takes a lot of work to get there. And then the I last think, letter is really intriguing, Charles. It's a G. Wow. It's a wild Picasso. It's Picasso in the 30s G. Well, that the fourth. That's the fourth letter, the G, right? Sorry, G. And then S. I missed the S. Yeah. Oh. So I'm all screwed up. But I'm going to say frogs. No, frogs. All right. Uh, Al is right that the F is a good way to start on that because you can really see the F once you know that it is an F. On the, on the upper left. But you know, there's something that's crossing out the left on the bottom, and it's, I love the, the, the S is, is like, it goes all the way back to the F. Yeah, what it's the like, heck is happening there? It's, it's a flourish. Just, the S is it's like, a right, flourish. it's a flourish. It goes all yeah. the way back. I mean, there's something- Frogs. Free. Frogs. <laughs> Frogs. Yeah. Hey, uh, I have the, before you get to the second word, I have a digression. You know, this could be your only, um, <laughs> The session of this time where you do close reading where we could just talk about the first word <laughs> for 15 no, we'll, minutes we'll the first past, word no we won't we'll, we'll talk past. about all four words um I, I just have a digression before you get to the black the second second word and that is just an observation about how we piece together quote-unquote bad handwriting you know when somebody you're looking at a manuscript a 19th century manuscript or wow. a note that someone hastily wrote a, uh, a Wallace Stevens manuscript because he, he wrote very vertically with a, you know, mm -hmm. a fountain pen and you could, and what you do is you do this, you take, you see a couple of recognizable letters and then you piece it together in context because you know the semantics and you have to do that here. It's a very interesting thing. Oh. I'd also note that if you're trying to do that with a name, you can't do it because you need every letter for a name, but these are not names. These are words that point to things or are action words. Okay. Anyway, let's. So we that. we never um, just pause at frogs for a second. We we never we in general readers don't give any semantic value. Don't think that it's meaningful the the way in which a letter is formed. 
right. especially handwriting, which is actually um, moving out of the culture. And yet handwriting can be expressive. Like yes, it's uh, anti-semantic conventionally, but you hang around with a lot of visual poets and concrete poets for whom right. But he, so true, because if you want to say frogs through your handwriting, you're going you're gonna to write it a certain way, yes? Yeah, and I also think especially of uh, Emily Dickinson and Susan Howe's um, work on the expressiveness of Dickinson's manuscript pages, which shouldn't be translated into typography, and Blake, too. So these are the two uh, most canonical figures who you might think of in respect to this, especially as wigged out as it seems. It actually uh, relates to, to those um, to those poets and to the possibility. A lot of visual poetry wants not to make the visual, um, the, the letristic elements actually be readable words. In Grenier's case, he always wants them to be readable as poems made up of words. You have to work a little bit to decipher them, but he doesn't want them to just be seen as lines or decoration. Is uh, it the words, case, words in space, he says, yeah. Is it the case? I mean, in general about humans reading, that if we work hard at deciphering a word, and I say deciphering, I don't mean it's semantic meaning, but actually what the letters are, um, we are being, I'm gonna make a judgment, better readers, more, more, uh, more, more, uh, more thoughtful, more attentive readers if we work hard, yes? Rather than just, oh yeah, go pass the yeah, word. Yeah, well that, that's right, because it, it's part of the, an aesthetic of of slow reading, slowing down reading. the and not translating every word into an idea or to an image. You know, think of Williams's uh, "No ideas, but in things," which I'm sure is is a is a important yeah. motto within Mod Poe. I mean, yeah. and he Grenier is a very close reader of Williams. I mean, Williams is right. fundamental for him. Williams. Yeah, and and uh, or a small or large machine made of words. Both of those things sort of resonate. I mean, Grenier is going in a different direction, but yes, you slow down so that you can savor. It's not only to make you better, but it's a, it's a great pleasure. The pleasure, like of eating slowly, as opposed to consuming. So he's against consuming language for its images or its content, and savoring it. Frogs, frogs. The next word is g go. Go, I see a G and an O, go. Frogs go, frogs go ing. Frogs go ing. G O, and then right in the middle is the I, which is Big very, I. Uh, very. Um, is that a pun, do you think? Well, the, the I also is a kind of a flourish uh, up and ab above, yes, in the center I mean, of the it. There's the speaker, there's the speaker. Go ing, I going, that's right. Frogs go I, I, N, N. And then G at the end, if you're if you're looking at it, you can sort of see that's the black going. Frogs going. And here you can do something, uh, Al, that's very significant, which is, you know, in the, in the many years that I taught up until last year, I would always get into like talking about a word or two or a phrase. And I'd always say to the... To, to the group is, you know, am I over reading the word I in this line strikes me as being related to this and that. And some of the students would say, yes, you're absolutely mad. Um, but others uh, would get into it because you really can't overread when you're going this slow. So I love your interpretation of the I, the lyric voice mm. being in the middle of that. But one might note that this is a post-objectivist poem by now by objectivist is uh, a term that um, I associate with especially Louis Zukowski another person absolutely crucial to Grenier and by that he means that the poem is not a speaking voice and you're reading somebody speaking but is a uh, is words on the page is is an artwork that's composed of the composition on the page and you and you read it so it doesn't have to have an eye speaking and these pastoral poems written in a field in the countryside evoke an experience of of uh, of the environment of, of the natural world of a frog yeah. in a pond yeah. a frog croaking in a pond thinking of poems by Basho famously about uh, uh, frogs and also I think of Emily Dickinson's I'm Nobody Who Are You which ends with the frog croaking to an admiring bog and which don't would be the real, Moore, real real toads in uh, in, in imaginary right. gardens and imaginary right toads. so 
So these are the th th three possible um, allusions or literary references in the poem. Is this poem an allegory, one might say? It would be interesting to think about, is it a metaphor? Well, yes, it's all those things, but it's also a bog. It's itself um, a complex network of words. Oh, and I think you're going to... Charles, it's a bog. Yeah. The poem is a bog where you might find a frog. That's really right. All right, well, let's right. get to the third word. But you're, you're the... Th are, I'm the third are, are you the that's third the word? Green. I think that's you are. Green, if you're following along. <laughs> green. The green. Yeah. By the way, Charles and I have both, I'm going to say endured. Bob Grenier is probably going to watch this and be mad at that. Uh, uh, that actually, that he probably won't watch it because he doesn't have a computer. Okay, well, that's we're safe then. But <laughs> Bob was, is very earnest and very sincere. And when he presents these, he'll say, oh, yeah, I'll do six or seven of them, and we will get through two in an hour and a half because he wants to talk about every, just the way we're doing, although we're doing it fast speed compared to him. And, and a real plug here for what Al and I do, a wonderful pen sound page for Grenier in which we have him talking, including at the Kelly Writers House. And he's absolutely magical uh, okay. to hear him talk about the same work, very different than, 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 than Al and I. I mean, I think we're on the same page literally, but yeah. he's, it's just marvelous to hear him but we're a little saner, we're a little more conscious of time. Right. Right. Speaking of sane, so the third line is a word in green, and the first letter S, say, I've got the A with the crossover, kind of uh, a Rococo flourish. It's sort of like a V, uh, crossing through the bottom of the A. Say, I can't decipher the N unless I know the E, and the E is marvelously fractured marvelously fractured sane frogs going sane and by the way i'm already in, as a reader invoking the torquing of an idiom frogs don't go sane no one goes sane that what they do is they go crazy go crazy going doesn't work for frogs frogs don't go they hop they sit we don't i i don't think that an a, a, a transitive verb it's actually intransitive uh, going has been applied to frogs very often, uh, they, unless they're going away. But they go sane. Fro froggy goes according. Froggy oh, okay, goes go. according. Well, that's, but that, that's an anthropomorphized frogs. And this, this is definitely not that. This is a natural frogs. Anyway, frogs going doesn't make sense until you get to sane, which is the opposite of insane. And that's what people do and frogs too. So frogs going sane, your turn on the blue. You know, and one thinks of that frogs, especially uh, for a, a, a city person like me, hearing the frogs croaking at a pond uh, would create something like a cacophony that would be indecipherable in terms of song or uh, melody or uh, uh, it, 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 it sounds, well, you know, slightly, not menacing, yeah. but but Doesn't like no, a lot man. of noise. So they, you could say that that's frogs going, you know, berserk, you know, because they croak so loud together. Yeah. So the frogs going sane really is a, a torque already on the assumption that this kind of environmental sound of the yes. overlay of different sounds is a kind of sanity and that the, the, the yeah. poem is grounding us in a kind of sanity. So right. the last word, and now going back even to the first, we have the frogs. Look at that. I don't know if we talked about the way the S loops around to the to the F. So there's a lot of swirling yes, you did notice that going that on and one again. thing is kind of intertwined with, with the next. So in the in the in the the first word there on the lower left in blue is is the first letter is M M M M, 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 M frogs going sane M, and then in the middle is an A. The cross for the A is, is quite low down and uh, has a kind of flourish itself. And then on the right side is, uh, I, I think this would be hard, but it, it's a D. It's a D. It's a mad D. Right. And um, I, I, I have to be honest with, uh, with our audience. Do we, do we have to be honest with our audience? I mean, they're, no. they're, uh, they're, they're people seriously interested believe, in this. Believe me. I want to tell them what we're doing. We each have our own decipherment of this that we're staring at, just in case I 
forgot and couldn't figure it out, which could happen to me. So we, we, we already knew it was frogs going sane mad. We figured that out before frogs going sane. Hey, Hey, Charles, I have another question for you, but first I just want to point out that the a insane and the uh, a in mad, uh, it rhymes as, uh, what's the word, uh, graphomorphically. That's right. Uh, because the, there, he, he really it has a pattern. When, when Bob Grenier writes an A in these drawing poems, it's the same thing with that weird V-shaped cross. Right. right? So, so in, it's yeah. totally regular. And yet, sane and mad don't rhyme. One is a short A, right. and the other is a, uh, one's a long A, and the other's a short A. But they rhyme as opposites because one is sane and the other is insane. So this is just in a nutshell how much he's playing with concepts of sanity and legibility. Right. So the, but also because this is the kind of, this is, you know, where a lot of people will just say, no, I won't go into this macro yeah. dimension. I won't plunge into the these, macro those, dimension. These but, folks are gone by now in this video. But, but yeah, all right. But look, look at the G's, frogs going. You have the G and the frogs and then the G in the beginning and the end of going. It's frogs going. And the O's, the frogs Going also has the double O's. You have the double O in the first two lines and the double A in the in, in, in the second line. These are very um, and then the S at the end of frogs and then the S in sane. So he's interested in these kinds of networks of microprosody, uh, repetition, somewhat a slant yeah. that creates an intensity of, of sound patterning and moving it into this possibility yeah. of an expressive dimension for writing where writing isn't just understood as, as noting down my thoughts as quickly as possible, a la Bernadette Mayer, wonderful as that is, but this is the opposite. It's very slow. Each word formulates itself slowly, and one has four words as a poem that actually is a, not a short poem because we can spend time contemplating it or meditating on it. For those who uh, use mandalas or otherwise look at uh, complex pattern things as a way of meditating, um, you could well think of this as a kind of um, uh, object or subject, I guess, of uh, for meditation and contemplation, not to allow one to let it become uh, uh, indecipherable or to think of it as dissolving into patterns without linguistic meaning, but the fact is that you see the meanings form and then dissolve and reform. I would associate it with uh, another kind of natural imagery, although in this sense the cosmic imagery of constellations in the sky. Once you see the Big Dipper, you know, then you see it when you look up, but then you look at it a different way and it dissolves into the sky without pattern, and then you see it again as the pattern. But right. being able to see the pattern of the Big Dipper, let's say, it's very significant that you see it as 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 the big dipper that it doesn't just seem like a set of of scattered um uh, beams of light or points of light and i think that moving in and out of decipherability of legibility is uh it relates to the frog sound them going sane mad and also relates to how poetry can be a holding space for reflection on our human language refracted back to us through our handwriting as expressive. Mm. Charles, um, what you just said made me think of the following. Um, isn't it the case that so much innovative or experimental or avant-garde writing is a, um, a, is a walking of the line between legibility and illegibility, between mm -hmm. sanity and, and madness. Uh, it's not just insane, just mad, just illegible, just impossible. It can't be. Uh, Grenier is the very, his work is the very definition of what an innovative writing should do, which is to get us to the point where we get it, and then he has that great sincere attitude. Of course you get it. You just have to work a little bit and then you get it. It's gettable, right? Right. So for Grenier, it's absolutely crucial that one reads these as poems, as words, and not uh, simply as, as a pattern or decoration or visual art that uses uh, 
a scrawl or a graffiti right. or other kinds of things. Uh, it's, it really, for him, exists very much within the world of poetry, I think for reasons that you just said. And, and, and I, th I think it was very, um, this, this, this divide between legibility and illegibility, but, but for him, always the, 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 the work to get to the, the legible opens up the richness and the sensuousness right. of the space. You could say, instead of frogs going sane mad, to respond to what you just said, Al, po poetry, poem, a poem going sane mad. Right. Going sane mad is a little bit like when Thoreau says in Walden, which this work relates to, I think, in many ways, um, beside oneself in a sane way. It's one of my favorite lines from yeah. Walden. Right. Uh, right. So beside oneself usually means crazy, but he's saying beside oneself in a sane way. And his image for that is looking into Walden Pond with his head yes. up, up against his other head. Right. Uh, uh, head to head. Reflection. So he sees himself, reflection uh, yeah. of his head, but they go, they go backward. They bounce against each other. And I think that this... Right. Going sane mad is is very powerful um, uh, way of understanding what you're talking about. That yeah. that in, in in it's it's a sane kind of madness. And I think this is what a lot of people don't understand. So don't understand. They reject. Well, maybe they don't understand it too, or they're uh, skeptical about it, which I can well understand <laughs> skepticism. But um, it, it's it, it really is sane madness it's a way to sanity it's not glorifying meaninglessness illegibility or madness not at all some Which poetry does but not think, this poetry people yeah. think the avant-garde is doing that i guess what i'm saying well, is some actually, some some does i mean yeah, I'm not, but this know, is actually more typical that um, i agree with you well, it's certainly more reasons. typical of the tradition that you uh, uh, chart kind of in like, mod po and that i'm a part yeah. of i think there are other yeah. you know there are other obviously other traditions but you know yeah. i like to think of this poem as meta literary historical in the following yeah. way, you know, he comes of age at a time of formalism. He, uh, formalism so, is expressed through close reading and he is very much masters it. And he cares about prosody and he cares about the micro poetics, uh, which was the good thing about close reading and is, uh, and he, and it, this is almost like the revenge of the, of the extreme mic extremist micro poetics guy. He's doing all of this prosodic right. work and all of this slant right. rhyming, all of this focus on consonants and so little focus on semantics. It's and, almost and, like he's, he said, you want, you want formalism? Right. And yet he and, brings it back to nature poetry. Which and, is and, and yeah, to an expressive movement. end and pastoral. Certainly they're, they're, they're pastoral poems, odd as that may seem. Now, we haven't said when Grenier was born. Let me put that in the context of Maud Poe as a whole, or 20th century poetry. So he's born at the beginning of the Second World War. He's 10 years older than me, uh, and I'm the, uh, in the generation born after the Second World War, famously right. called the baby boomers. He's very much not a baby boomer, and I think that the, the, the generation that he's a part of values a certain kind of Ex, ex, extreme eccentricity and not connecting up to larger social movements and explanations of what those social movements are that I would associate with 1968, and, uh, uh, at least those of us who came of age in 68. He's one of the, 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 the pioneers, really, who made 68 possible. So you could think of, in pop culture, John Lennon and Bob Dylan. But in poetry, uh, Susan Howe uh, and, uh, and Lynn Hygienian would be two of his, uh, you know, immediate, Clark Coolidge, uh, would be two of his, uh, three, three of his immediate company. And so he is... Um, ab about 10 years younger than Creeley and Ashbury and Barbara Guest and that, that generation of the new American poets. So he, he fits in in between before the my generation, born after 1945, but very distinctly different than the new American poets. And I think that particular group um, is doing something that I've just always found uh, astonishingly powerful in the in the introversion of it, the refusal to generalize out, to proclaim the kind of resistance of a certain kind of rhetoric, which, by the way, I completely embrace myself. But I I I, I love that resistance and that um, the, almost the purity of the eccentricity 
yes. of this project. Uh, he is unrelenting in the insistence on it, even though the it's, electricity. Yeah. it's brought him, you know, no, nothing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's allowed him to create great poetry, but it completely puts him outside of any ability to, to circulate a, as a poet because the work is very difficult to reproduce, to decipher. So it sort of pulls him out of the whole, you know, culture industry of poetry, uh, which many wonderful poets participate in and many poets that I'm less interested in, but he's really remains outside of it. Mm -hmm. So he's also managed to make himself an outsider, not to be an outsider, not as a dramatic gesture, but because of the passion, the commitment, the pastoralism, the ecstasy, the material joys of opening up writing and the individual letter on the page. So mm -hmm. all packed up into frogs going sane, mad. <laughs> you can, it, when you see what, what this means as something within our culture that yeah. this is produced, it uh, seems to me as astonishing it and is astonishing. wonderful. Yeah. Charles, I'm going to have two more questions for us, and we'll have, okay. to make, make, we'll have to make some haste with the two of them. The first will be for the two of us to do a lightning round back and forth on why this seems to be a meta poem. And uh -huh. the second will be to bring the basho in to think about the frog and the pond and the sound and the materiality of sound uh -huh. and nature. So first, meta poetry. I'll go first. This is going to be a lightning round. We'll each toss in reasons why we might argue that this is a meta poem. All right, I'm first, and I'm going to go back to the, the prominence, the centrality of the I. It is not a subjective poem, but the I is staring us in the face, just like, feels like the first line of Moby Dick, which is not a subjective novel. <laughs> it's, even though it's a first-person narration, it's a novel that's completely, completely crazy, sane, sane mad, but it begins and ends with an I, and you can't get away from it. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And I think it's reminding us that the situation of the frogs is the situation of the poet. All right, your turn. Why so it's not, it's not I see frogs going right. saying mad. Right. And it's not I feel great joy in seeing. Right. It just presents... I the stuff itself the the yeah. it, it presents the act of the frogs going sane mad as as a poem so that perhaps was what make it meta but it also is not conceptually self-conscious in the way that one might associate with the meta it actually is what it is it's nothing yeah. else all right well I only meant meta in the sense that oh. it makes the stake of the poet but well, I think it's turn. it's I think it's a very uh, powerful way to think about how it dissolves the idea of the meta, while yeah. at the same time being exemplary. Right, so the second turn. was Basho? No, no, I want, I want you to say why also it's a meta poem. Your turn. How else is it a meta poem? We know it is. Well, you seem to have some particular thought about the, the, the Oh, no, the, the, you the, think the meta I'm yeah. not, I don't know where uh, we're. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it, it, a, a meta poem is also something exemplary. And I think that the, the form of the poem is, is exemplary in the way that the that it it that it it can't be read outside of the process so this would relate to john dewey's uh, you know very influential book for grenier's generation and creeley's generation creeley being an absolute crucial uh, figure for for grenier of uh, of process that you learn what something is in process not in in a product so here the meta-ness has to do with this conversation you must if you read it and i mean we must in the sense of moral obligation it, it's it, i know this worked very very well but i still have to struggle to decipher it that deciphering slowing me down is the process in the Dewey yes. sense of art as process. So you cannot it, read it without going through the process of reading, without thinking of the expressiveness of words and the letters. So the meta-ness is the meta of the process. It doesn't let you, right. it doesn't let the process uh, dissolve into it, a meaning. It's, it's, it, it, what you're saying, I think, is that it's metapoetic in the sense that it's, as it's being written and as we are reading it, it is teaching us how to read it, how it is to be read, Right, and so we can't help but thinking about the process. It's like slow eating. If you slow way, right. way down when you're eating, you begin to realize I'm eating. Whereas if you're just incredibly hungry and you eat the meatloaf in two gulps right. and down it with some water or soda and you right. get up from the table, you probably didn't even realize you were eating. 
it's a, it's a savoring. It's, it's about savoring. And it's savoring not just vowels, consonants, right. uh, words, but also um, savoring the, the ability to recognize and to lose recognition, to find yourself immersed in yeah. the words, which is why I'm using this uh, perhaps somewhat annoying by now background pattern just to emphasize there's a meta image where I'm emphasizing that I'm in the middle of the poem. Yes, I'm not on the other side. So the only thing is I would say teaching maybe, and that's a perfectly fair comment, especially when I mentioned Dewey, but I would also want to say allowing or permission. It yes. gives you as a reader the ability and allows you to do that. It makes you realize that that's part of what the experience uh, is. And, sure. you know, I mean, the, 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 we, it, it may seem esoteric, but I would say that a lot of uh, things like going to a, to a, a, a fun, uh, you know, a, a roller coaster or a, or a fun house and so on, a lot of times we slow things down or we speed things up to intensify sensation. Yeah. That intensifying sensation in language is one of the, you know, many things, but certainly for Grenier, fundamental, and for the kind of poetry I want, fundamental. Um, you know, possibilities, desires to increase sensation. How do you increase sensation? I think Grenier would say, Grenier doesn't say you're going to, by my telling you, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling happy. Right. Uh, these different things happen to me, which creates a kind of voyeurism and you experience yeah. you through it. You're in the pond. You're yes. hearing the frogs. You're yes. hearing the bleeding of the frogs. And the, the visual representation here, which yes. I suppose is the meta poem as well, the allegory, is that it almost begins to seem like the frogs bleeding yes. when you look at it. Right. right. And that uh, would lead very I'm well gonna, into Basho, right? Well, I'm going to throw out one more meta poetic quality, which actually oh. picks up on what you just said. And then I have a comment about Richard Wilbur. And then we're going to go into Basho really quickly. Okay. So. You were implying, as you were talking, I was sketching out a ratio. The ratio is, the, first of all, I was thinking about you being the frog in the pond. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing there with that. that, that back. In the middle of the pond. Yeah. In the middle of the pond. And the next thing you know, you're going to start croaking uh, or bleeding. I think you meant frogs going insane, <laughs> man. Frogs going insane, man. It's a little, a little high registered for frog. Yeah, I'm sorry, anyway, you're right. Frog. So, but the analogy to me, Good the point. ratio to me is frog. Frog is to croak, right? Frog is to uh, bellowing. Yeah. As poem is to writing. That yes, is, sure. Right. So you get that's the meta poetic. Uh, it's an well, art. Poems, poetic. poems it's going art. sane mad for sure. Writing going sane mad. Letters right. going sane. Well, mad. that's what these. That's what this kind of writing is doing. It's croaking. Mm. You know, Absolutely, and, and I think for someone like Nate Mackey, who makes a big deal about the vibration of the voice rather than the smoothness of the voice, mm -hmm. right, um, is this, uh, this, this idea of the creaking of the word, that's his phrase. And I think that means, in other words, it means there's a musicality there, and it, it, it's one thing rubbing up against another, which is the analogy of the vocal cords vibrating. And that's, you know, what, you, that's what we get from frogs. You, you could have this now and you know we could issue it as a mod po t-shirt frogs going sane mad it's rather marvelous as a <laughs> as a slogan it's absolutely it's unacceptable poetry. but but grenier does not want it to be translated no he doesn't that way. this is all contra grenier the you, comment i promised about richard wilbur i'll just say it and then we'll move on to basho mm -hmm. uh, we have a poem in mod po uh in the uh, uh section on the uh new formalists uh and uh, here it's a poem called the death of a toad it's not a frog there's a big difference it's a toad but in that um he's got a suburbanite mowing the lawn and the and a, a toad gets caught under the mower and uh a lot of people are very upset at me because i uh not only criticize this poem but i ridicule it because it's a classic example of the subject beating up on the object the the the, the frog the toad in that poem is just an object and the subject is this grand mock heroic uh, suburban. He's critical of himself as a suburbanite. He's a leftist. He's a, he's a li liberal guy, Richard Wilbur is in this. And he's saying, woe is me, woe is the suburbanite. Oh no, I ran over, isn't it a bad thing I ran over this toad? But the toad is small game to that subject. And I think what Robert Grenier is doing is sitting there much, much like the best of Thoreau, he's sitting there thinking there is a subjectivity in this frog. I need to get close to it. 
I need to be, I need to participate in it. This is so, this is kind of an antidote to uh, death of a toad. All right, I'm gonna read a few translations of the famous Basho. And I'm, we're gonna end, so you're gonna have to be brief, but uh, I'm gonna read a few and- there As so would be appropriate many, in commenting so on Basho. many translations. <laughs> no one has really gotten this right. And what it makes me think of, and this is again, Grenier's not gonna love this, um, is there is a multivocality, even though he wants us to get it, you know, and to under decipher it, there is still an indecipherability, at least in the process. And in a way, the Basho poem can't be translated any more than this thing can perfect, be perfectly settled. So I'll read a few and then you can end by commenting. So the, 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 the famous, uh, is the Lef Lefkadio Hearn is the is the easy no. the famous one, which is old pond frogs jump in sound of water. But there are others. The old pond a frog jumps in the sound of the water. An old pond the sound of a diving frog. Old pond and a frog jump in. Frog jump in is hyphenated. Water sound hyphenated. Pond there still an old. A frog has jumped from the shore. The splash can be heard. That's a little literalistic. Uh, the lonely, one last one. A lonely pond in age-old stillness sleeps apart, unstirred by sound or motion, till suddenly into it a little frog leaps. What does that have to, what does this Basho have to do with what Robert Grenier is well, doing? Well, for one thing, uh, one thinks of haiku, that is to say, very, even apart from the actual syllable count, but um, uh, very condensed and short poems. So Grenier is, is rethinking what a hyper short poem would be because we didn't talk about fro one syllable frogs, two syllables going, one syllable sane, one syllable mad. So it's, it's um, five syllables. And the, very minimal. The three, yeah, four of the, three of the four lines are, are one syllable. So that kind of attention uh, to its syllable count and is is m makes makes haiku seem ex expansive. <laughs> all, all, also, uh, I I think of just the the, the way in which uh, I imagine Chinese classical poets being in the world, which is out in nature, drinking rice wine and sort of uh, uh, dissolving into the natural landscape. And I think that Grenier is interested well, in reimagining what the pastoral would be in a post-World War II way growing up during that Second World War world, all of the incredible dislocation and urbanization and technology. And here he's going back to the technology of written language. And actually, another thing that you could say about this um, in respect to Basho is the Chinese written character, not to bring up the very problematic understanding of what that is in pound, although interesting, but still he's a close reader of pound. So there's a way in which Grenier is trying to create in English, in American really, with the Roman alphabet, something like what pound thought he saw in the Chinese written character, which is that he could stare at the character and see what it meant. And the Japanese as well, of course. Uh, yes, well, the Chinese written character yeah. in and then, China and Japan. And, 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 and I'll just conclude by uh, uh, capping off the observation that you just made. Um, there's something about the Basho frog thing that gets you to hear sound in something that's very, very quiet, right? And I think what's going on, despite the disruption of the four colored pens and the page, it seems very chaotic. It's actually very quiet. And going right. is the verb. It's a very quiet verb. Going is very yeah. passive. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful observation pretty, in the pretty, sense it's that... It's amazing that the word mad would be in a poem sort of like the opposite of howl, Ginsburg's howl. Right. Well, you <laughs> think about the... Mad the, about it. The, almost like the neon signs of Times Square, you know, where I'm, I'm from, the downtown. And this can almost look like it's, a, it's, it's, it's electrified, frenetic traffic and so on and yet you know as you've just said it it, it it has that charge but it's actually just these four words and that the natural sounds environment of the frogs croaking has as much 
energy and telecommunication right. as right. does our uh, time squares. It's, it strikes me as remarkably ambient in a way that fits in any setting, right? So you can take the ambience of the cliche ambience of sitting by a bog and listening carefully and move that ambience as so many interesting poets like John Cage, move that ambience to the city, to the urban. Try a little pastoralism in the city. Charles Bernstein, uh, this has been so much fun. The poem is number three in a series of poem drawings. Um, we could call it Frogs Going Sane Mad, but if we do give it that title, then it gives away the work that the reader has to do. You can find it on the EPC Robert Grenier page. And uh, so I've been with Charles Bernstein, and I just want to say thank you to Charles. Thank well, you thanks so much. so much. It's a pleasure to talk with you and to be part of Mod Poe. Fantastic.